Listen to the hadith. It says, The people of Jannah لا يتراءون الغرف من فوقهم كما يرى أهل الأرض الكوكب الدرية في أفق السماء that the people of paradise, they will be looking at one another's ghuraf, chambers, in paradise from above them, just like the people on the earth look at the stars in the sky, in the heavens. So, your house could be here and your brother's house could be up there by the stars. That's how much higher they are. And that means they're in a better place or a bigger place. There's a lot of real estate there. It's the whole of space. I mean, I don't even know how much. Allah, Allah will just give. And you know, you understand that from the last person out of hellfire, the biggest sinner ever to live, he gets the sign, uh, double the size of this world or ten times the size of this world according to different hadith. So there's a lot, lot for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give. So somebody said, Ya Rasulullah, those rooms right up there by the stars, you know, from our vantage point, they must be manazilul anbiya. They must be the the abodes of the prophets. So he says, No, Walladi nafsi biyadi. Rijalun amanu billah. By the one in whose hand is my nafs. These are just other people who have, who have uh, brought faith with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Was saddakul mursaleen. And they confirmed the prophets. So these are people. These are, just, these are not the anbiya. They, they, they have another, they have their own place. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam tasliman kathiran ila yawmiddin Amma ba'd To continue with our series on the Kitab al-Hikam of Ibn Atayillah al-Iskandari with its commentary by Shaykh Abdullah Gangohi rahmatullahi alayhi rahimahumullah We are on page 114 and wisdom number 195 on page 114 of the book of wisdoms so this is what he says i love this one this is one that makes you really understand why we worship and what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us in our worship so this is what ibn atayillah al-iskandari rahimahullah says he says alima qillata nuhud al-ibad ila mu'amalatihi فأوجب عليهم وجود طاعته فساقهم إليه بسلاسل الإيجاب عجب ربك من قوم يساقون إلى الجنة بالسلاسل um, He knew of the irresolution of servants in dealing with him He knew of it, the irresolution Irresolution means how we would delay doing his worship We'd be lazy. We need a lot of encouragement. So he knows that about us. Because Allah created us. So because he knew of this irresolute nature of the servant in dealing with Allah. So he made obedience to him obligatory for them. He made it wajib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that people would be lax. So he says, okay, you have to do this. Because when you have to do something, you take it more seriously. Thus, he drove them to obedience. Allah is driving us to obedience. He's pulling us to obedience with the chains of obligation. Wujub ki zanjiro ke saath. Hame keech ke itaat kara rahe. That's essentially what he's doing. And then he mentions a hadith. He says, Your Lord is amazed. Your Lord is amazed. At people who are driven to paradise with chains. And he says, "He tajuk ki baat hai ke zanjiro ke saath jannat mein kiche ja rahe." Like it's amazing that is. So this one's always amazed me. Subhanallah, that the reason Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is making us do this obligation is He wants us in jannat. But if He left it to us, then because we're lazy and distracted, we have so many other things to do nowadays and all the time. So that's why he says, I'm going to make this obligatory on you. Because at least you'll get to Jannat that way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Ibn Atayillah is mentioning the wisdom, the hikmah of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made certain things obligatory on us. However, what we have to understand is that this hikmah, this wisdom, 
is important and really important to know for the people who just look at the apparent reasons of why we do things. Those people who've understood the real essence of worship, then this doesn't make any difference to them. Because they're doing it out of their love anyway. They know they're servants and that's what they have to do. So let's, what does that mean? So essentially what he's saying is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that people might be a bit lazy in dealing with him, in doing these things. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Saba, verse 13, وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ Little of my servants, only few of my servants, comparatively, are fully thankful, fully grateful. Like very few people are fully thankful and grateful. Because you know what? If we were really thankful, we'd be thanking him probably throughout the day. You know, there's, I've, I've never, any time you start thinking about what Allah has given you, then you can't stop thanking him. But it's about remembering that Allah has given us so much and that He is giving us so much, then you'll thank Him. It's like basic things, basic things. You're sitting in your car and you're having a nice ride. It's, it's a reason to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're sitting within this nice AC place, it's a reason to thank Allah. You see uh, these clips that are going around about Pakistan and India, Gujarat and in Karachi where there's floods and people are their houses are submerged in water. That, subhanAllah, shukr. We're doing shukr. Alhamdulillah, we're not like that. May Allah relieve them as well. There's just so many things to do shukr for. There's so many things. I mean, I sat here and I thought, mashallah, what a khidmah this masjid does. It gave two bottles of water. One was cold and one was room temperature. What wisdom, mashallah. And it's really good because sometimes you're giving a talk and they give you cold water and it gets your throat. SubhanAllah, so room temperature sometimes is better. But I was really hot, so I had the cold one. Allah ta'ala protect the throat. But Allah reward the brother who did this. But it's a thank to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shukr, 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 shukr. The fact that we're even sitting here right now and discussing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shukr. I'm just giving examples there. I'm telling you, anytime, anytime, anytime you want, think about something, you'll do shukr. Even if you're in major pain, there's still so many other things to do shukr for. But that's the problem. Majority of people don't do shukr like that. They're not shakur. They might, do sh they might be shakir sometimes. Shakir is shukr karne wala. A person who does some shukr. Shakur is the one who's intensely, deeply, profoundly thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shakur. It's an uh, intense version of it. May Allah make us of the shakur and the shakirin. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Tusad, verse 24, ma hum, Very little of the people who fully are obedient and so on. That's the nature. That's the nature of people. Um, that's the category of people we come from. And we hope to be in a higher category. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this anyway, He says, okay, I'm going to make some things obligatory on you. You have to do this much. I know you guys. It's like you say to your children, I know if I don't tell you that you must pick up the dastarkhan and clean up the table afterwards you're not going to do it so this is an obligation it's your duty if i leave it to you you're all going to push it on one another that's what they do then children he should do it i did it yesterday so now you're going to make it obligatory today's your turn tomorrow it's your turn tomorrow it's your turn it's obligatory we have some system then and at least then there's no aggravation and everything works and then he said that if you don't do it i'm going to punish you he warned you of punishment. That's actually to help us do it. The purpose is not the punishment. Allah doesn't enjoy punishing people for no reason. So that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is driving us with chains. Chains of obligation. That's what he means by driving us with chains. Subhanallah. Um, now in that regard, there's a hadith, there's a narration regarding prisoners. Um, that, that's why this, uh, the last point of that was to say that your Lord is so amazed by people who are going to be driven in chains to Jannah. Like, mashallah, look at these people. They're being chained to Jannah rather than to a prison, to hellfire. So the reason, is that, uh, uh, the reason why mentioning that particular statement is that a prisoner has no options. A prisoner has no choice. A prisoner can't make demands. A prisoner is... In prison, essentially. The Prophet used to invite people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Come to Allah, come to Allah, come to the presence of Allah. Don't just become believers. 
enter into the presence of Allah. Fi hadaratillah. And then the Prophet ﷺ used to tell people that whoever does this, they will be successful. And whoever opposes this, then there will be punishment for them. With collars around their neck, shackles on their feet, in hellfire. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He wants us to be imprisoned and shackled with the chains to Jannah, not the other ones. If we break this chain to Jannah, we don't want this chain, we're not going to be obedient, then we'll be chained towards hellfire instead. So yes, it feels tough sometimes to pray on time, to get up on time, to avoid the haram. It's tough, it's difficult. But we're prisoners at the end of the day, but we're prisoners inshallah to Jannah. It's just a short stint in prison, and then inshallah it'll be to Jannah. Some of the ulama, they have mentioned... Now, um, you see, uh, people with Iman, different scholars have ranked them differently. Some say that there are three categories of mu'mineen. Others say there's only two categories. There's no real difference, it's just that some divide them a bit more, but the others, they just put them together, and I'll explain. So, the three category is that uh, and this is in relationship to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amazed at people who will be driven to Jannah in chains. So he's saying that, uh, why, why, why is Allah astonished by anything anyway? Allah knows everything, so why is He even amazed or astonished? You're only astonished by things that surprise you, right? Do you get, do you get astonished by things that you know and that you predict? No, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not be astonished by anything. He knows everything. Right? However, the point is uh, really subtle that this is an amazing system. And he's, this is telling us that this is an amazing system that I've put you into. That you feel like you're in prison, but what you are really is you are in prison to Jannah. You've been chained to Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us about this amazing paradise with eternal bliss and everything inside. So what Allah is saying is that the Jannah that I've told you about, Jannah in Ardu has Samawatu wal Ard, and there's going to be um, these rivers that will flow therein, and the beautiful uh, canopies that you'll be staying under, and the beautiful flute, uh, fruits that you'll have, and everything else, Hurum Maksuratun fil Qiyam, and everything else that you will have. So it'd be strange for any Aqil, any reasonably understanding person that they don't want this why wouldn't they want this they would want this it'd be surprising if they didn't want this this is what Allah is astonished by that I've made such a beautiful place for you come on and you want to come and uh, waste your time in these other little things this is where the real place is so this is the surprise that I have to actually put chains on you to take you in what's wrong with you guys you should be the will ukul if anybody was the will ukul, if anybody had intellect, proper understanding, then they would rush towards this. And they would be willing to undertake difficulties to get there. Because you know that if you're going to stand outside that shop from 12 o'clock or 7 o'clock the day before, then you'll, get, you'll be one of the first to get your iPhone. Because then that's going to make you feel really good. So that's why you're going to do that. So that's why Allah is saying, what a strange matter that I have to chain you and say, I obligate you to get to paradise. You should be running to it yourself. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't benefit in any of this. Allahu ghaniyun anil intifa'i bil manafi. Allah is totally independent of benefiting from anything beneficial. They're not beneficial to Him, they're beneficial to us. So then the only reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated us to do this and prohibited us from doing the other things is to provide benefit for us and to remove harm from us. So that's why he said, you better fulfill these fara'id and obligations. And the only reason he made you do that is because he wants you to for paradise and he gave you a taste of that by allowing Adam to be to, to have stayed there for a while. And that is eventually where we'll all go back, inshaAllah. That's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed Adam alayhi salam to be there first. And we all have the DNA of Adam alayhi salam. So we've all experienced paradise. That's why we want paradise. 
Well, that's why we should want paradise. Because we've been there sometimes. We were there in the loins of Adam alayhi salam. Because we came from him. So inshallah, that's what, that just proves that Allah wants to give us paradise. That's why he sent us there at least for a short stint through Adam alayhi salam. Some of the scholars, they say that obediences, ita'at, when we are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people are obedient to Allah in, at different levels. And also when we oppose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's different levels of opposition. Right? Some people oppose slightly, some people don't care and they oppose blatantly and, out, and openly and without any concern whatsoever, with very boldly as well. So if you, obe uh, people who obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're going to be at different levels in the hereafter as well, just that as they are at different levels in this world in their obedience. And people who disobey, they're going to be at different levels in terms of the depths of Jah Jahannam as well. So these guys are going to, the people of uh, obedience are going to have darajat, and the people of hellfire, they're going to have darakat. That's what you call the darakat, the levels of hellfire called darakat. And the, of paradise, they call darajat. That's why one hadith of the Prophet said that the people of Jannah, and, and now this, this hadith will give us an understanding of how different people are going to be in paradise in terms of the different levels, how far the differences are going to be. It's not like he's got the biggest house on the street. You know, he's just next door. No, when we're talking about big in paradise, listen to the hadith. Says the people of Jannah, لا يتراءون الغرف من فوقهم كما يرى أهل الأرض الكوكب الدرية في أفق السماء. That the people of Paradise, they will be looking at one another's غرف chambers in Paradise from above them, just like the people on the earth look at the stars in the sky, in the heavens. So, your house could be here, and your brother's house could be up there by the stars. That's how much higher they are. And that means they're in a better place or a bigger place. There's a lot of real estate there. It's the whole of space. I mean, I don't even know how much. Allah, Allah will just give. And you know, you understand that from the last person out of hellfire, the biggest sinner ever to live, he gets the sign, uh, double the size of this world or ten times the size of this world according to different hadith. So there's a lot, lot for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give. So somebody said, Ya Rasulullah, those rooms right up there by the stars, you know, from our vantage point, they must be manazilul anbiya. They must be the, the abodes of the prophets. So he says, no, walladhi nafsi biyadi, rijalun amanu billah. By the one in whose hand is my nafs. These are just other people who have, who have uh, brought faith with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَصَدَّقُ mursareen, And they confirmed the prophets. So these are people. These are, these are not the... Ambiya, they, they, they have another, that they have their own place. So now, as I was going to tell you before, some, uh, some ulama have divided believers into three categories. Um, and you need to understand this so you don't get confused. The first category, he says, uh, is that servant who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purely because he's a servant. He just knows, I'm a servant, that's what I need to do. I got no other option, that's what I do. I'm a servant, that's what I do. That's my life, that's my existence. I'm just a slave of Allah. Just uh, a few days ago, somebody contacted me and says, I do dhikr, I'm regular on my dhikr. I'm doing all my other worship. I don't do anything haram, whatever. But I have no sukoon in the heart. You have no sukoon in the heart. I said, the only way to gain sukoon is when you fully have give up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When, when nothing, nothing bothers you, because you know that I'm just a servant of Allah, whatever. There must be some parishani in your life that is bothering you. There must be some desire you have which is not being fulfilled. So why do you like, yes, I believe in Allah, whatever He says, but do I have full rada bil qada? Do I have full satisfaction with the decree of Allah? And I think there's no way you can get full sukoon until you just eradicate everything and you just become total slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a big... I said, don't worry about it. That doesn't mean that you should stop doing dhikr because you don't get sukoon. That's the shaitan making you do that. To get full sukoon, I mean, mashallah, that's, it's a grace of Allah. He gives it to him, wishes anyway. And it's not beyond Allah to give it to anybody. 
So anyway, this first category of people, they are a servant who worships Allah purely because they're a slave. And it's not like I'm a slave, I don't like this and I'm just a slave, so I must do it anyway, I'm going to get beaten up. No, shukran. Out of thanks for Allah that, you know, I've just got this existence and maybe I'll go into Jannah. You know, maybe I'll be close to you. Right? Wa imtithalan. And I have to do this anyway because what else can I do? I can't do anything else. I'm just a slave. That's what I do. Wa qiyaman bi haqqil khidmah. And a person who wants to fulfill the khidmah and the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with, with great love and understanding. So, what does Allah give such a person then? This is just not one-sided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't waste the deeds of anybody. فَزَادَهُ اللَّهُ الْوُجُوبُ فَزَادَهُ الْوُجُوبُ شَرَفًا وَعُلُوُ وَدَرَجَةٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase this person in honor and in higher status. The second person, the second category is عَبْدٌ أَطَاءَ اللَّهُ تَعْظِيمًا لِلْمَوْجُوبُ is the person who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by honoring whatever is obligated to him. He's honoring what's obligated to him. He doesn't have the full servitude like the first person, but he still honors what he has to do, that I must do this, I respect what I have to do, so I must do this. So in this case, the wujub, the obligation that's placed on him. So in the first category, the obligation that was placed on him was just to honor him. That yes, you, you're a servant, we know you believe you're a servant, but this is just to honor you that yes, we're making you do this out of honor, you know that you, we know you respect us and thankful to us and so on anyway. The second category of person, the obligation on him is just to remind him. It's just to remind him and to express the wisdom express or make clear the wisdom for why, why he does what he does which is that he respects whatever is obligatory on him he hasn't res this person has not reached the status of the first one where he is just i'm just totally a slave i'll do whatever it is out of respect i totally i'm in love with you right then the third person is the one who worships allah as well these are all three people who worship allah by the way this person worships allah khawfan min adhabi because I'm fearful of your punishment. That's why I worship. I'm going to be straight with you. I'm fearful of your punishment. That's, otherwise, I wouldn't do it. But I don't look at That's the only reason. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. You know? وَرَجَاءً فِي ثَوَابِهِ And I want the rewards. I want paradise. This paradise sounds really good. That's what I want it. The first group doesn't even bother about paradise. They just want Allah. But paradise is where you get Allah. As I've said before, and this was amazing when I found out first time that one of the reasons for paradise is that because paradise is the place where you get to meet Allah every, every week. Otherwise, you won't get to meet Him every week. So that's why we want paradise, to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this person anyway, he wants rewards from Allah. And then he says, وَلَوْلَا ذَلِكْ مَا عَبِدَهُ If it wasn't for these, then he wouldn't have worshipped. So he's very clear about that. فَالْوُجُوبُ فِي حَقِّهِ لُطْفٌ بِهِ So the obligation there is still compassionate for him. That, okay, at least, at least you got the basic ticket inside. You may not have the upgrade, but you'll have the basic ticket. Wafil kulli khair, but all three categories are good. They're still good. At least, let's be in one of these categories. At least the lowest category, if not the other two. Washatana ma baynahum, but there's a massive difference in terms of what they're eventually going to get between all three categories. There's a big, big difference between them. So, this is according to some ulama. This is the three categories. They make sense. <coughs> they make sense. But others, they say there's only two categories. Let's just make it simple. There's only two categories. One is the one who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he has to. Because it's a responsibility, that's why. It's my job. I have to work from 9 in the morning to 5 in the evening. Otherwise, I won't be able to feed my family. Jobs are difficult nowadays. I better keep this job. I better work. Let me get to work on time. Right? That's what they do. وَهُمْ أَهْلُ التَّكْثِيفِ وَقِسْمٌ أَطَاءَ but the second group are those who do it because they venerate Allah. They want to do it because they respect it. You know when you do khidmah for somebody because you have to is different to when you really respect them, you're willing to go out of your way to do that. So the first people, they're takthif, they're, they're, there's a barrier there. Whereas the second group of people, they know what they're talking about. They have ma'rifah. أَهْلُ الْحِجَابِ أَطَاعُوا خَوْفًا وَطَمْعًا The people with a veil still, the 
the people, people with still a veil, they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of fear and hope. And the people who have experienced and who know the truth about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fully, they just worship out of love and thanks. That is generally the maqam of the anbiya and the special awliya. So he said there's only two categories. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us into that special category. That's why, that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when somebody questioned him, that why do you stand for so long that your feet get... Because that's a compassionate, like, a, if you've got compassion, like, ah, bitna kyukarre, like, why are you doing so much? Afala akunu abdan shakura, he said. Shouldn't I be a thankful servant? Because Allah has given me so much and uh, I'm just a servant, so I should be a thankful one. So according to the scholars of spirituality and ma'rifah, they say that the wujub, the obligation in our lives, why we're obligated to do certain things and not other things and avoid other things, is just to show what level of servitude we're at. It's just to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give us something. That's all it is for, really. Suddenly that just becomes a bit easier. You know when you know that I have to pray and I'm obligated to pray and so on, and fast and zakat and everything, because that chain is going to take me to paradise. Does that make worship a bit easier now? Well, I hope it does, because that's the purpose of it. It, de- it did for me. It made it a bit like, well, alhamdulillah, you know? Because now I know what's going on. It just makes it easier. So the obligation, there's no intrinsic benefit of the obligation itself. It's for the purpose. It's for ulterior purpose. It's to, it's to fulfill Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, desire with people that they should go to paradise. That's the, that's the purpose. But still, there's some people, they say, I don't care about that. Even if you make it obligatory, I don't want to do it because I enjoy all of this other thing so much. I don't know, subhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make it easy and protect us. There's another narration. It says that there will be people who will enter Jannah on these, on these specially prepared platforms or stages. It said, who are they, Ya Rasulullah? They say, Adhaqirun Allah kathira. Those who abundantly remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why they say that the, you know the people of that first category who really worship Allah with this full understanding that they're just slaves and I must do this out of respect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's really interesting, they're saying that such people, sometimes they could be lying down and a person from the other category is praying salat, but this guy is getting closer by just lying down than that person praying salat. That doesn't mean these people lie down all day. <laughs> Don't get that wrong, okay? Why do these people, they, when they're lying down and they're relaxing for a short time, they're getting a bigger reward than this person praying? Why? You think, well, what kind of a crazy equation is that? That's an easy one. But you have to work a, a very hard to get to that. Then your lying down will be like that. But if you pray, then it'll be even more. The reason is the sentiment in your heart. The reason why you're doing what you're doing. This person, when he's lying down, there's a special intention in his mind. There's a special reason why he's lying down. He's not lying down for laziness. And this guy who's praying, he's praying, but he's praying because he's worried about that hellfire only. He doesn't have the love for Allah of why he's praying at that level. The people of that first category, they, whenever they do anything, they do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And their even minimal worship though they do a lot of worship, but even their minimal worship is very weighty and valuable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there's so much emotion and sentiment in there. And that's what Allah looks for us. He looks for the emotion in our heart. Right? He looks for the desire in our heart of why we're doing something. Even though it may be a little action in what you see. In fact, all of their worships all of their movements, because they're always so focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of their movements are rewarding for them. When they sit to eat, they're rewarded. If they go out for a walk, they're rewarded. Because even that forms part of their contemplation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِذْ تَصَرُّفَاتُهُمْ كُلُّهَا عِبَادَةً نَوْمُهُمْ عِبَادَةً Their sleeping is worship. وَأَكْلُهُمْ عِبَادَةً They're eating is worship because they're eating for the right reason. 
they're sleeping for a very particular reason. وَمَشِّهُمْ ibadah. That's why there's this statement, it says, نَوْمُ الْعَالِمِ ibadatun. Not every alim, I wish it was. The sleep, the, the sleep of a scholar is a worship. As long as he's doing for the right, he's a proper scholar, then his sleep is worship. Right? Now, you think this is very difficult, right? How are we going to reach this status? So this is how he ends it with. He says, وَلَا يَسْتَغْرِبُ الْعَبْدُ مِن نَفْسِهِ بُلُوغَ هَذَا الْمَقَامِ Nobody, nobody should think that this is impossible for us to reach. Like, how am I going to reach this? Why am I speaking in Urdu today? I don't know, when I see some people who I think are better with Urdu, I don't know, I just feel like speaking Urdu. Asar hota hai. Are you better with Urdu? Chalo, aapki, aapka, ye aapka, aapki tawajju hai. Or aapki tawajju hai, mashallah. Right? So anyway, nobody should think, nobody should find this difficult and impossible that they could reach this status. فَإِنَّ فَضْرَ اللَّهِ لَا يُنَالُ بِسَبَبٍ because the grace of Allah can't be achieved through any particular means. But وَقُدْرَةُ اللَّهِ صَالِحَةٌ لِدَرْكِ كُلِّ مَطَالِبٍ The ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the qudrat of Allah, is absolutely capable of allowing you to reach whatever objective. So we're not going to do the next one today, but in the next one that's exactly what he explains. He says that anybody who finds it Impossible that Allah can pull him out of his desires that he's been struggling with for the last 10 years. Because you've been struggling for the last 10 years. When is Allah going to take me out of this sin that I've been committed? And he thinks, he can't, Allah can't take me out of this. I've been trying for 10 years. And how is Allah going to take me out of this heedlessness? Then he has belittled the capability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The divine capability. Allah can Allah ala kulli shay'in muqtadira. Allah has ability over everything. So his focus needs to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let us read now the summary of this commentary by Shaykh Abdullah Gangohi rahimahullah what he says to round this up or round this off rather. He says, in every state and circumstance, the worship of Allah most high and the display of one's ubudiyat and servant, servanthood are imperative and incumbent on the servants of Allah. We have to be obedient anyway. And this is the demand of intelligence, whether Allah Most High decrees that worship is obligatory on us or not. Even if, if, he, even if he had not made it obligatory, we would still have to worship him because that's who we are. That's what we're supposed to be. Because the duty of the slave is servanthood, regardless of whether his master commands him to do that or not. Just think, if, there were, if namaz and salat was not obligatory, would we have prayed five times a day? Have we found in our salat such pleasure that, you know, I don't care if it's wajib or I am going to pray? Once in a while, I guess. But would you think we would have prayed five times a day? Because we enjoy it so much and we know why we're doing it so much. Otherwise, like, oh, it's not obligatory. Fars to nahi You know, it's a nafil hai. You know. But on account of man's indolence and defects regarding the rendition of worship and out of Allah's boundless mercy, Allah Most High decreed the duties of worship obligatory on his servants. Along with this, he notified them of his promise of paradise for obedience. I'm gonna, not going to make you do it for free, I'm going to give you something. He further warned the transgressors of the chastisement of hell. The similitude, the example of this imposition of worship as an obligatory duty is like a chain that is tied around the neck of a prisoner. The prisoner is taken by means of the chain in a desired direction. Oh, I don't mind. You're taking me uh, to, uh, to enjoy myself. No problem. I can go with the chain. That's okay. In fact, most people are in chains of shahwat. And they think of, of their haram desires. They're chained to them. That's why they have to go there. That's why you feel like you must go there. You, you have to go there. And you miss out on good things because you feel like you must go there. That's so enjoyable. That's a chain. This is, you can't, we can't see the chain. So... He says that a prisoner will not complain 
if, it, if the chain is taking him in a desired direction, irrespective of his wishes. Similarly, by decreeing obedience obligatory, Allah Most High draws the indolent ones towards worship and obedience. And then another example of mercy and love is a guardian who trains and punishes his subjects who perpetrate the wrong. He does not permit unbridled freedom to the child so that he can do as he please. Nobody lets their children just do as they please. If you do, that child might enjoy it when they're young. When they grow up, they'll, they'll, they'll hate you because they would have so many bad habits. They won't be insan. So then they'll hate you. That you let us do and you're just doing your stuff. The child is thus compelled to do his duties, even the ones he dislikes, and to abandon detestable characteristics, whether he likes it or not, because children think in a different way. No, no, you have to clean up. You have to make your bed in the morning. I remember one child, he's about 11 years old. Why do I have to make my bed? I'm going to mess it up at night again. I'm like, how do I explain to this kid? I'm going to mess it up again. So why should I clean it? Ajeeb. It's like, how do you explain that? It is maybe surprising that some servants have to be drawn towards paradise by means of chains. However, because these deeds have been imposed on them as compulsory duties, they oppose their desire in the execution of righteousness and gain entry into paradise. So even though we are uh, being chained in these obligations to go to paradise, we're still making a choice to do them, so we still get rewarded for them. Because th there's no physical chain that we're... Uh, that's going to force you to pray It's just a command Right? And you have to have at least some love of Allah to fulfill that command Some love to fulfill that command May Allah just increase that love for us وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام وتبارك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث اللهم يا حنان يا منان لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين جز الله عنا محمد ما هو أهله يا معدن الجود والكرم يا أكرم الأكرمين ويا خير المسؤولين ويا خير المعطين ويا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وعافنا واهدنا وارزقنا اللهم اغفر لأمة سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم الأموات اللهم إنا نسألك تمام العافية ودوام العافية والشكر على العافية اللهم احفظنا من البلاء والآفات والمحن اللهم جنبنا الفواحش ما ظهر منها وما بطن يا الله we ask you for your special forgiveness we ask you for your mercies we ask you for your generosity we ask you for your benevolence we ask you for your kindness يا الله we ask you for your mercy we ask you for your forgiveness that will erase all of our misdeeds, our wrongdoings, our transgressions and our sins. O oh Allah, forgive us our heedlessness, our negligence, our laziness, our procrastination, our inattentiveness. O oh Allah, forgive us for not having the required love for you. O oh Allah, forgive us for not being the proper slaves of yours. O oh Allah, even though we are slaves and we can do nothing without you. O oh Allah, we have no ability without you. But, O oh Allah, we don't act like slaves. O oh Allah, allow us to recognize our worth, our status, our position, our true state, our true self, and make us true slaves and true ubudiyat. O oh Allah, we thank you for the obligations you have given us. We thank you for all the mercies you have on us. We thank you for all the fact that you have allowed us to be believers. The fact that you have allowed us to be here. The fact that you have allowed us to learn something new. And O oh Allah, the fact that you have allowed us to be of those who pray and those who are concerned. O oh Allah, we ask that you increase this for us. O oh Allah, everything comes from you. Even this raising of the hands. If you didn't want us, it wouldn't happen. O oh Allah, we thank you for allowing us to raise our hands to you. O oh Allah, and we take this as a good sign that you want to give us. So Allah, give us. O oh Allah, grant us. O oh Allah, grant us. Each one of us here has different desires in their hearts. O oh Allah, different needs in their life. O oh Allah, different things that they want. O oh Allah, each one you understand directly. Each one you can see. Nothing is hidden from you. O oh Allah, grant each one who is listening, who is praying to you, O oh Allah, what's in their heart, whether we ask for it or not. O oh Allah, grant us what's beneficial for us. And O oh Allah, do not test us. O oh Allah, we are weak. O oh Allah, 
Oh Allah, allow us to stand tall. Allow us to stay away from the shaitan. We are tired from fighting against him. Oh Allah, we wake up with a good intention in the morning, but by the evening we have sometimes lost it. Oh Allah, oh Allah, we have good intentions in the evening, but by the morning we have lost it. Oh Allah, keep us steadfast, keep us straight. And oh Allah, grant us halawat al-iman, grant us the sweetness of faith, grant us sukoon. Oh Allah, grant us blessings. Oh Allah, grant us the tawfiq to remember you abundantly and to remember you constantly. And oh Allah, make us your true servants and true slaves. Make us of the group of the awliya. Make us of the group of the higher believers. Make us of those who are just longing to meet you and you are wanting to meet them. Oh Allah, make the, our final days our best days of our life. And oh Allah, remove these difficulties that people are facing today. The insaniyat bring back to the human being. The, the oppression that many, many believers are uh, feeding around the world. Oh Allah, remove that subjugation. Protect our Masjid al-Aqsa. Protect our believers in, in India and all the other places where there's difficulties. Oh Allah, we ask that you protect the Haramain al sharifain and allow us to go there, allow us to frequent there, and allow us to go there and benefit from your closeness. Oh Allah, we ask that you protect our children and our progenies until the Day of Judgment from all the evils which are out there. Oh Allah, accept us and fulfill all of our permissible needs and our permissible projects and anything good that we have done, make it truly for your sake with sincerity and assist us and protect us from all the uh, the difficulties and obstacles and evils which are out there. Oh Allah, accept our du'as and bless all of the people of this masjid and who cater for this program and who organize this program. Oh Allah, everybody who assists, oh Allah, accept them. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun al mursaleen wa alhamdulillah. The point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules and at the end of that inshallah you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind, you can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.